beads, 108 beads. And he was approached because in his previous incarnation, he'd been renowned for doing the Mo. So they considered that this new incarnation should be able to do the Mo. And yet, even though he was a Rinpoche and he'd had 14 years of training by now, you know, long retreats, these four-year retreats they do, and all the practices and all the pujas, before his teachers would allow him to do the Mo for people, he had to do a special six-month retreat where he learned to clear his energy channels so that a particular deity called Paldan Lamo. Paldan Lamo is the major protector deity for the Dalai Lama and for Tibet. And she's the deity for divination. Now, it's not very clear here, but this is what's called a gore, which is like an amulet. And you can see here, there's the head of Paldan Lamo. This is her body, and she's riding on a mule. Can you see that? Yeah? So she's, she's one of the fierce protector deities. You know, she's got sort of strings of skulls and everything around her. And in his six months preparation to be able to do Mo divination, he had to clear himself and, and put himself under her guidance and protection so that when he did the mo, she spoke through him. Uh, as far as, as the high lamas anyway are concerned and the oracles, they are not the ones who are doing the divination. They are merely channels, mediums. They, they get their energy channels so clear that they don't get in the way of the deity. In this case, a goddess. Lamo means goddess, Pald, go, the goddess Paldon, Paldon goddess. Now, Paldon Lamo I found quite intriguing. I had been working, as I said, at an ashram in Bihar, and the lineage of that ashram is the Saraswati lineage. He was Swami Satyananda Saraswati. His teacher had been Swami Shivananda Saraswati. And Saraswati is a bit like Bridie. She's, she's wisdom, she's music, she's poetry. Um, and His Holiness Karmapa of the Kagyu lineage has Saraswati as one of his special deities. And Paldan Lamo apparently, when whoever it was, I'm not sure who, but they spoke to Saraswati, the goddess, saying that Tibet needed protection. And Saraswati agreed that she would be the protector for Tibet. And she walked into a stone. Must have been quite a megalith, really, this stone. And she turned around within the stone, and she came out as Paldan Lamo. So Paldan Lamo is like the, the fierce aspect of the musical, poetic, wise Saraswati. And I find it really intriguing how the Tibetan deities are so closely linked with the Hindu deities. I mean, we're always taught that Tibetan Buddhists are non-theist and all the rest of it, forget it. The people have their deities. And the nun who told me the story about Pound and Lamo, because I always did English conversation with the nuns, because the nuns get so little. They really badly treated the nuns. Um, so I always looked at to, to help the nuns. And she told me that in Tibet, they would always every morning do the puja, the, the, the prayer to Pound and Lamo at their particular nunnery. And in Tibet, the deities were always given beer and meat. But in India, the Dalai Lama has said for all the monasteries to be vegetarian, so the deities only get bread and tea, <laughs> which I thought must piss them off an awful lot. <laughs> bread and tea instead of beer and meat, yes. I, I'm sure Pound and Lama would rather have beer and meat, personally. Okay, so another aspect of divination, this beautiful lady here, 
is called Alma. Um, and the young gentleman with her is my translator, who was English teacher at the secondary school in Sarah J Monastery. The monasteries are basically there to educate. They're, they're like monastic universities. And they get the kids coming through from Tibet and Nepal and Bhutan and everywhere from about the age of four. A lot come from the age of eight. And they spend the rest of their lives as monks. But it's not a vocation. It's an education. So traditionally, the, the monasteries were places of education. Um, and so they have a secondary school. And he was English teacher at secondary school. Now, Amitabha this lovely lady here. She does divination, but she does it using bronze plaques. So you've got a bronze mirror. And she looks into the mirror. In fact, she's three mirrors, and they're placed in bowls of rice. And she will look to the furthest mirror, and if Paldon Lamo shows herself, then she knows that she can do, do the divination. And she looks into the second mirror where her own personal deity that is appropriate for that divination appears. And then she looks into the first mirror and then that's the answer to whatever you've gone to ask her about. Now, she is village wise woman. Yeah, she's a, the, you've got the Lamas, the Rinpoches, with all of their training and all of their meditation and all of their retreats. And the Tibetans consider the High Lamas, that's 100% reliable if you go to any one of them for, for, for your divination, that they really are there. So, you know, the Dalai Lama, if he says something, you take it absolutely on trust, 100%. Same with the Karmapa. The village people are used very widely by, 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 by village people and sometimes by the monks depending on their reputation. So they're not considered 100%. They can have good days, they can have bad days, sometimes they're spot on, sometimes uh, not so sure. And, and that, that, that's true, isn't it? I mean, we all know that, those of us who practice divination. It takes the years of meditation practice and retreats itself to that point of clarity of awareness where you can be 100%. Most of us, it's, it's an off-on basis. Amitabha here had the most amazing reputation. And she was the seventh person in her family to do divination, to do the mo. So her father had done the mo, her great aunt had done the mo, and so on, up for seven generations. And I'll give an example. I'll give the example from my translator, that he and his wife had been married for quite a few years and hadn't had any children. And they were really bothered by this. So they went to the doctors, they went to the hospitals, they had all the tests, should be fine, should be no problem. They went to Amitabha. Amitabha did the divination. She said to them, you must do these pujas, you must give this money, make these offerings, and you must do a pilgrimage to Bodh Gaya. And Bodh Gaya is a very sacred place where, where Buddha became enlightened. And it's a big journey from South India. So it was a lot of their, their money, their time. They had to put a lot out to do this pilgrimage. Within two months, they conceived their first child. So he loved Amitabha, of course because she had helped him out. Now, I was also, as I said, I was doing research. I was working with monks, and I was working with some Bhutanese Nyingma Lamas. And when I was asking them, sort of at the end of the work that we'd done, and I asked them about any experiences they might have had, one of them said that he had been to Amitabha. So this was a Lama going to Amitabha. Um, and he had been because of his brother who had been very sick. And Amitabha had helped it, his brother to get well. So she was, she was really renowned for, for her divination practice. And very much within the folk tradition. So also part of the folk tradition is what is called the cham dancing and the oracles. And it's a shame that you can't see it more clearly. But this is part of Tibet's shamanic origins. Yeah, we're not Buddhist when we talk about the cham dancing. 
craft traditions. Now, this is a particular ceremony that happens at what's called Losar, which is the new year. And they always have big ceremonies to celebrate the new year. Um, these people here um, are, 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 are gods. They're, they're gold-faced gods. They always have a bit of cartoon. And you've probably seen pantomime elephants. Well, here you've got a pantomime snow lion. And the pantomime snow lion really did pantomime. And you will find that however serious the ceremony, there will always be an element of cartoon. There will always be the element of play. Um, and it's like the joker, the clown, the cartoon is essential for good magic to work. That you can't have the magic actually happening without that element of the joker and the play within it. Because every ceremony I went to of theirs, of this type, where, where you've got the, 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 what they call the cham dancing, which is sort of sacred ritual dancing of the gods and the deities and you get horned being. Um, you, you always have the cartoon. Um, and down here, which sadly you really can't see very well, um, we've got what are called Garuda birds. Um, now, again, it's a link with the Hindu because Garuda is the vehicle for Vishnu and Garuda is a made up bird, a bit like the phoenix um, and is, is the bird on which Vishnu flies but you get Garuda birds once again with the Tibetans which I, I just find this really intriguing, this link between the Hindu, which is still the traditional animistic shamanic type of, of religion, and then within their shamanic rituals, you get the Hindu appearing again. So here we are at the Losa ceremony, um, and you'll see here they've got this big fire, um, and what they have done is they've taken these, um, imp I want to call them implements, but you'll see on, on the next slide, that they are things of the old year that you want to get rid of. So they're symbolic things, but they're symbolic things from the old year. The dancers are doing the dancing, um, and you can actually see the dancers here in the background. The dancers are doing the dancing. These are being taken to the fire, and then they light the fire, and they always make sure that it's a pretty mighty blaze. Now, we have exactly the same thing, don't we? Guy Fawkes. It's the Samhain fire, essentially. That Samhain is the Celtic New Year. What do you do at the New Year? You have a huge big fire to get rid of all the crap from the old year that you don't want to take into the New Year. Exactly the same tradition happening here. And here, a little bit more clearly, are those Garuda birds once again. Um, and I showed this because here you've got the big high lamas, the head of the Nyingma sect, all dressed up in their finery watching the Garuda birds. Um, but in this one, um, actually see here is... ...and crap, yeah? Can you see that they make up? And that's what they're putting on the fire, um, all, all of these um, entrails. Um, Again, not very clear, but here's one of the cham dancers all dressed in the finery. And you get the mixture between the dancers who have the horns and the animal faces or the bird faces or whatever, and what I call the high priests who are dressed up with their big hats and, and they always do the ritual together. Um, and in this case, here is the clown and it's a skeleton clown. And I really like the fact that they use a skeleton as a clown. And the skeletons clowned for the whole ceremony. They were playing with the kids, they were taking off hats, they were, you know, really cavorting about at the front with the kids the whole time that these dancers were doing their dance and the, and the, the trauma was being taken through to go to the fire. So, classic ritual, classic ritual. And very nice, the, the, the way they do it. and a, a real good way of leaving behind the old year and going into the new. What's all that 
Well, it's actually made of, of, of butter and wheat and barley and stuff like that, but they fashion it as if it's entrails that have come out of your guts and it's all nasty stuff. It's what they make it look like, and then they put it on the fire to burn up all the nasty stuff. And um, well, what, what do they mean by doing this? Getting rid of all the bad, so that you don't take the bad, you don't take the yucky stuff with you to the next year. Um, is it just a, um, a, a thing which means that, or, or are they just give, make, giving away the old in, in a magical ritual, you do something what's called symbolically, as if it's real, because that enables it to actually happen in real. Huh. That's what a magical ceremony is all about. This is another magical ceremony. Um, a Oh, also at Losar, but this is actually the Sarah J Temple of the monastery where I was working. And it's called a Purbu blessing, and a Purbu is a magical dagger. Now, those of you who know anything about um, witchcraft in the West will know that the dagger or the afame is considered one of the sacred instruments. And you get exactly the same thing with the Tibetans that they have a Purbu, which is a magical dagger with the white handle again. Um, and this one was all wrapped up in, in sort of a silk scarf because it was ancient and so precious and so sacred. And you can see the queue of people. And this queue like went on for about eight hours. That and the queue of people, you're going into the temple, you're going around to the back of the temple, and sitting in his throne is the abbot of the monastery. And as it's a monastery of 5,000 monks, he's a pretty big abbot. And he's sitting in the purbu, and as you go past, he bonks you on the head with it. So everybody bonked on the head with magic dagger. And it's meant to be the blessing, the, bless the, the blessing of the dagger. And after you'd had that blessing, you then were allowed to go into the upper rooms and the back rooms where they have all of their magical instruments and masks and stuff like that, which you don't get to see. Again, it's part of Losar, it's part of the new year, you've got rid of all the crap at the fire, you've had the dance and everything to get rid of the old, you then get messed with the dagger get this one chance in the year to see the really sacred objects, the, the, the magical items. Now, obviously, no photographs in those sorts of rooms, so I can only tell you about it, and you can't actually see it. But I'll show you some of the masks and stuff um, that I, I came across at other places. So this, you've probably all seen um, as being made. Well, this was at Napoli. Not at Losa, it was another ceremony, and they made seven of these sand mandalas. Uh, mandalas are a magical ritual in and of themselves. Um, when I was working in Dharamsala the first year, Holiness Dalai Lama was doing Kalachakra ritual in Canada. So he'd gone over to Canada and he was doing Kalachakra for the Canadians. Um, as an initiation, a ritual initiation. And back in Dharamsala, his monks at his monastery were making the Kalachakra San Mandala at the same time as he was doing the ritual in Canada. So it's a symbolic thing, it's a ritual thing, it's a magical thing that is part of initiation ceremony. And they're making the mandalas, of course, special prayers are being done, but they also have the special gates and they put different deities at different places within the mandala, making the deity, bringing the energy of the deity in, in a very symbolic, magical format. So, sand mandalas are integral to the old shamanic, magical, ritual aspect of, of the Tibetans. Yes. Um, if this, um, was this a long time ago? Long, long time ago. The old objects. Yeah. Yes, they're from long ago. And uh, uh, did 
they have any problems with people trying to steal them? Yes, there's always problems with people trying to steal magical objects because magical objects have got so much power and that's why there's only one day in the year when the people are allowed to go and see them. And then there's lots of monks standing around making sure that nobody steals anything yeah. because they're so special and so... But these are not, these are made, these sand mandalas are made, and then at the end of the ritual, they're just all mixed up together, put in a bag, and they're taken to water, always taken to running water, to a river, and put into the running water so that they get dispersed. And then that energy, whatever the ritual was about, whatever the ceremony was about, then gets spread out to the world for everybody. So everybody benefits. So they do quite a lot. And what's, what's the difference to the monks and everybody? Well, the monks are having to do this work on behalf of the people. That's their job. Mm -hmm. The monks' job is to do the magical rituals for the good of everybody else. Oh. That's, that's, that, that's, that's what they get paid for, basically. And, and did, did any of this magical stuff get to the world? Well... There's a big question mark there because the Tibetans got thrown out of Tibet by the Chinese because they relied on their protector deities to protect them and they didn't keep an actual army going. So I think that we need to follow the motif which says trust in Allah but tie up your camel first. Mm -hmm. that and that means that you've got to do the practical as well as the magical that you can do your magical rituals to save the Amazon and you've got to make sure that you don't use any of the <laughs> products that they're getting from cutting down the Amazon. You've got to do both. <coughs> Why did they make this Well, people have done magical traditions since the beginning. They've always done magical traditions because they believe that it works. Yes, and people believe that having the blessing of the object will help them through the year. Just like my translator, for the divination, and then he was able to have children because he'd cleared whatever the bad was at that spiritual magical level. And um, what was the bad? Who knows? Let's carry on. Healing. So part of the shamanic tradition is healing. Um, and I came across this sort of healing both with a Rinpoche, with a High Lama, and have you got a problem with something? It's okay. Carry on. Um, both with a, a High Lama and with a village woman. And I've got the picture here for you from, from the village woman. So both the High Lama and the village woman used these bronze discs. And as you can see, the bronze disc is quite intensely engraved. It's got the different animals from the, the Chinese and the Tibetan years going around. And it's got a bit like the I Ching trigrams. So um, it, it, it's way back from, again, from the shamanic tradition. Yes, it's from long before Buddhism. And what they do is what you can see this lovely lady exhibiting with this little boy who was happy to be, um, be photographed, is they put the bronze disc on the body until they find the place where the cause of the illness is. And then from that place, the bronze disc is moved up the body so that the energy is taken up and then out. And the difference between the village woman and the lama is that the lama would have a bowl of water that was placed above the head and the energy would be taken up and into the bowl of water and then the water would get thrown out. Whereas she just took the energy up and out. Now, most days when I would be walking through the villages, at somewhere or other I would hear a drum going, the beating of a drum. And that drum was also associated with a healing ritual being done by the lamas. And in this case, they would make a little doe figure of the person who was sick. 
and the doe figure would then be sat in a, in a little cardboard throne covered with cloth and have what was called a thread cross at the back of it, which is a cross of sticks where you put threads diagonally of different colours. So the thread cross would then be back of the person. They would do this ritual with the drum, taking the energy and putting it into the doe figure. And the doe figure would then get taken to the crossroads. Once again, the crossroads. Any of you who know your Western magical traditions, it's like there's so much that's so similar. Taken to the crossroads, left at the crossroads for the crows and the dogs basically to eat and so disperse all the bad energy that way. So it'd either be taken to running water, as in the case of sand mandalas or the, the bowl of water, or with the doe figures, it would be taken to crossroads. And what really intrigues me about these magical traditions of Tibet is that in so many cases, they're so similar to the magical traditions of the West. And it's like the animistic, shamanic worldview is common right across the world, what's, wherever you go. What's a crossroads? Crossroads, where you get four roads beating. Or one road going that way and another road going that way. When it gets taken to the crossroads. You're not getting it. OK, let's see if that works better for you. I'm sorry? Hecate, yes, that's right, she of the crossroads. So there we've got the Roman thing of the crossroads. We've also got the crossroads within the British tradition, got the crossroads also in the Tibetan tradition. I find it really intriguing that go around the world and at this magical shamanic level similar things are coming up again and again and again and again and again and and that for me you know learning about the tibetan folk traditions in this way and i kept on coming across hey but i know this from from the the, the celtic and from the british traditions I, I and i loved it it was like yeah and that's why i sort of wanted to come and show it to, to all of you here, so that you could see how similar things are. And, uh, and what, did, what did this little figure get taken to the crossroads? A little doe figure. Yeah. Which you get exactly the same in Britain, where people made doe figures um, for magical purposes. These are house protectors. Um, now, here we're up in Ladakh. So I've moved now from the Tibetans in the south of India up to the Ladakhi people who are basically Tibetan culture but they're within India so their culture is not being destroyed like the Tibetans have been in Tibet um, and every house will have its protector and we can see it a bit better here <coughs> and you see basically it's a skull um, they were deer skulls, fox skulls various different wild animal skulls that are done in like a sort of a corn doily, very similar to corn doily um, in what they're done, although this will probably be barley um, because it's only barley that grows up there. But every house will have a protector on it to, to make sure of the, the safety of the people within the house. Oh, people believe that skulls are very powerful yeah. because they used to contain the head of the animal and this is the most powerful bit, the head. Oh. So skulls. And in fact, the Tibetans will use skulls in their rituals and they use it as a bowl and they used to put the blood into the skull of whatever animal was being sacrificed for the ritual. And I've been to places where I've seen human yeah. skulls being used in this way and human thigh bones being used as trumpets. So using the bones of an animal or a human is considered very powerful magic. <coughs> These were wonderful. This again is in Ladakh and I said I'd show you some of the magical objects that you get to see when you go into the special rooms in the temples that, that you can only rarely get to see. Well at Losar was the only time I ever got in to see them. But these were temple um, called Saspol, with right high up in the mountains. We're now talking about being 14,000 feet up, 
Yes, it, the, this the, way, way high up in the mountains. Um, and in this particular temple, they actually had them on either side of the temple door. So the, the wooden pillars that were either side of the temple door, and these were the masks that, that as I said, that you normally only get to see sort of hidden away in, in, in the, the, the special rooms. Well, they reckon probably in this village that people weren't going to steal them. This temple was pretty far away from the sorts of people who would steal. In fact, in that culture, people don't steal because everybody knows everybody else. There's no such thing as money. You're all sharing everything together. So you don't get thieves. It just doesn't happen. It's a very different sort of world from this world. But the temples do still need their protectors. Um, and these, these masks must be, I would say, probably a thousand years old. So, you know, Why they're really ancient masks. Why do they protectors when there's nobody stealing? Protectors at a psychic, energetic level, magical protectors rather than physical protectors. So what do the magical ones do? Well, they can make people sick. because that happens. Here's another of the protector deities. And I'm showing you this protector deity to show you how they believe in keeping them covered up most of the time. So most of the, the tankers of the really powerful deities will always have a cloth over it. And only once a year or whatever will the cloth be taken because they are considered to be so powerful that they have to be hidden. And again, this goes back to, relates to the magical traditions in Britain where things are kept secret. In something that's really sacred is kept secret. Things are kept hidden. The more powerful they are, the more sacred they are, the more you just don't put it on public display that when you put something on public display, it loses its power. And in order to keep it really powerful, you keep it hidden away. And the, the Tibetans do this all the time. Now, this particular deity is one called Yemantaka, who has got three heads. The first head, the lower head, will be an animal head with horns. The second head, which is just above the animal head, will be a human head and the top head will be a Buddha head. And it's supposed to symbolize our journey from our, like our animal nature up through humanity to enlightened nature, to, to, to the compassion and the wisdom of, of Buddha. Um, and one other thing that really intrigued me with this one is that it's got all these different arms, which are, each of which is holding a magical implement of some sort. Again, really like you get with the Hindu gods and goddesses, where all the different arms will be holding a different magical implement. This was an amazing puja that I got to see in somewhere called Zanskar. Zanskar is a valley right up in the Himalayas. It's an 18-hour journey on a cart track over a 5,000 meter pass. Um, it's so remote. Uh, now I think they're building or have built a road to Zanskar from Ley, so it's not so remote. But when I was there, it was still really remote. People still living, self-sufficient lifestyle, um, a non-money economy, all the communities working together. And they had a problem in that there was a plague of crickets that were beginning to encroach on the valley. And they were really concerned that their crops were all going to be eaten by the plague of crickets. So they got this Rinpoche, this guy, and you can see him again there. They got this Rinpoche to come to do the fire puja where he had the fire burning below him and he poured special incenses and herbs and oils, all sorts of things onto the fire while doing the ceremony. 
and then afterwards the people came and they built up the fire with, with um, yak dung, with cow dung, to make a really big fire. So the, the central bit of it was to the ceremony done with all of the oils and incenses and herbs and everything. Then they piled the yak dung over that so that there would be a big mound of ash and then everybody in the village could come and take their portion of ash to put around their fields to protect the fields from the crickets so that the crops wouldn't be eaten up by all of the insects. So, I mean, you know, here, we're, here there are people who will do magical ritual, but it's a, a few people. Here is the whole community. The whole community who really believe that the magical ritual of the fire puja done by the Rinpoche is going to protect the crops. And that's important because protecting the crops is your food for winter. It's life and death. Can I just say that burning animal dung actually Insects yes, anyway. that's right. But they, oh, they, they, they not only burn the animal dung, they also do the ritual beforehand. That, that it's like the two are done together um, in order to make really sure that what they're, what they're doing there is, is going to protect the crops. And, and for me, it's, I mean, would you be getting that in Britain these days? You know, go to any farms, any farmers, are they going to be doing this sort of thing? No. Whereas in Zanskar, this is what the, the whole valley did. The, the, the Rinpoche, he went from place to place to place to place to place, doing this ritual at each village so that the whole valley would benefit from it. Did it work? I left shortly after, so I can't say whether it worked or not, but I hope it did. Because as I said, it's their food. Their winter food. I mean, I took this picture of, of, of them, you know, building up the thing just two days before I left. So um, I, I've no idea because that, this was happening literally the, my last week that I was there in Zanskar. You could phone the people who were doing No, I couldn't actually. Why? Because they um, don't have telephones up there. They don't have electricity up there. They don't have running water up there. They get their water from springs. That's a bit strange. <laughs> Traditional lifestyle. And it's a, a sustainable lifestyle. It's one that they've been living for thousands of years. And if climate change doesn't affect them too badly, which it is, they could continue living. Continue and don't change. Well, the change is happening because climate change is happening. And already they're not getting enough water to irrigate their fields because the glaciers have retreated so far that already one in ten of their fields is not getting enough water. So already they're not getting enough food. Why aren't they? Because there is too little water from the glaciers. Because they've retreated so far because of climate change. It means they've got smaller and smaller and smaller, so they're giving less and less water in the summer. So it's actually a bit tragic up there. Who's giving less and less water? The glaciers. The glaciers hold the water uh, as ice, and they melt in the summer to give the summer water that they irrigate their fields with. Huh. However, I was lucky enough to be there whilst the culture was still alive. And as part of a thanksgiving to the Rinpoche for doing the, the fire puja to um, protect against the crickets, this old guy here did a storytelling for him. Um, and this is a place at the head of the, the Zanskar Valley called Zangla. So I reckon I've been in Shangri-La because Zangla and Shangri-La are close enough. And it was like being in Shangri-La. And he did a traditional storytelling where he was doing it with movement and chanting. He was chanting the story as, as, as he told the story. Um, and then afterwards, these women in their special costumes and special, um, special headgear did, did a dance for him. And if you could see this picture properly, I tell you, it is absolute paradise with the, the mountains at the end and, and the roses flowering. 
um, and that was their, their thank you to the, um, the Rinpoche for doing the ritual for him. Questions? You can ask questions now. I think I've come to the end of me, me slides. Have you written it up? Have I written it up? No. People keep asking me to. I might do. <laughs> Maybe one day. I know, exactly. And I think because so few people have written and talked about the, the folk traditions, and because I was enabled to connect with the people at this level. Oh no, I think there might be a little bit more after this. Let's just see, that, that maybe I will do. Yes, this was also in Zanskar, um, where some of the young people are now being sent out of Zanskar for education, which is actually destroying the culture and the community, but Never mind. They felt so grateful to their, their community for giving them that opportunity that they had 21 statues of Tara made, which were going to go into the temple in the center of Zanskar, which was the Dalai Lama's temple. And they brought these from Delhi on this Land Rover. And as you can see, the Land Rover is covered in kataks. And every village coming into the valley, the the Land Rover had to stop. All the people got blessed by having the statue bonked on their head, like with the, 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 the dagger, you get bonked on the head with the statue. Um, and then they would all settle down and there would be a table set out with tea and biscuits. Um, and the statue would be fed tea and biscuits. And of course, all the people who were traveling with the statue got fed tea and biscuits as well. So. A 20-minute journey took us three hours to do. <laughs> and I got invited to, to travel with the students who were bringing it in because my interpreter was one of the students. Um, and so I got to do this just incredible trip of bringing the 21 Taras into the valley um, and into, into the, 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 the temple. So I thought I'd share that with you because it certainly isn't something that you'd, you'd get normally. Yeah, because every village you stopped and had tea and biscuits because the villagers all wanted to give tea and biscuits to the Tara statues, having had the blessing of them. Did they just stop the car? Yep, the car was stopped. There's all the villagers standing in the way, stopping the car. Yeah, oi, don't do this in. And actually that brings out another thing, one of the really key things that struck me with... Um, being in places like Zanskar, is that so much of the ceremony is about thank you and offering and thank you and giving. It's all about giving, giving and giving thanks, giving and giving thanks. There's a certain amount of asking, like getting rid of the, 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 the bad so that when you go into the new year it's clear, or somebody who is sick and doing the ritual to get rid of the sickness and putting that out. But an awful lot of the ritual is about thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and giving. Gratitude what? Gratitude. Gratitude. Really yeah. Gratitude. A lot of the rituals about that. When, so when did you go, um, visit this place? This is about four years ago, five years ago. Did you live here? I spent three months up there, which was a really special opportunity. Uh, and um, did you... Um, do you, would this all the places you went in three months? Well, three months. I spent mo a lot of my time here in Zanskar. And then where you saw the temple masks, that was Saspol. I spent some of my time there in Saspol. And, and I spent some of my time in, in the main town, which is called Ley. And did you actually see the masks for yourself? Yes, yeah, so, so all these photographs are ones I took. Does anybody else have questions? <laughs> I've got a very good question I hear. Have people um, in there um, stolen anything? 
Then? No, because they're, as I said, people don't steal in this culture because they're all connected with each other. They all know each other. There's oh. no thieving. And, um, if, and, and there's the, no money. And if someone so. bad comes in, they say, no, it's only <laughs> this community of people. Well, it's very difficult to get into places like Zanskar. Because it's 18 hours driving over a cart track over high mountains. 18 hour over a cart track? Well, I've driven 21 hour from um, Wilkeshire to the south of France. Yeah. Wilkeshire and then... That's a long journey. ...near Mulva to the south of France. Yeah. But there's more than one road, isn't there? Well, there's only the one road, you see. Well... Um, well, we Only the one road with no towns in between. Yeah. Well, we we have um, gone. Uh, we have. Uh, be, we're gonna go uh, next year. Nice. And we do it every five years. Lovely. But this year it went a bit out of date, so it was every. It was six years. Okay. Of, uh, and um, and it's a sort of uh, company. Does anyone else want to ask about what I've been talking about? Yes. Um, did you experience any other rituals that were practiced? So, um, yes, I did. Um, I haven't got the pictures with me because I decided I, I didn't want to have too many pictures. Um, but they're again in Zanskar that one of the monasteries was doing a five-day ritual and all of the monks from all of the monasteries in the valley came to this one monastery for the five-day ritual and the family I was staying with took me to, to the place where the ritual was happening because their uncle was a monk there and the girl took me down into the temple, which was like down underground. And over the door of the temple, they had a, a, a stag with antlers. So you went under the stag with antlers down underground, all lit with butter lamps. The whole place was, was, was dark with the grease of the butter lamps and then the, the butter lamps. So you got all the fumes and incense burning. And they were doing the chanting and the beating of the drums and the blowing of the horns. And as we walked in, there was this guy who was like sitting cross-legged on the ground and he spun up into the air, came down on his feet and rushed off with a whole load of monks running after him. And I discovered later that, that he was the oracle and he was actually going into trance and giving his, his, his divination at that time. And I can really understand in that atmosphere how an oracle could go into trance and do that because the drum beat is this typical shamanic drum beat that just takes you and then along with the darkness and the chanting and the lamps somebody who's sensitive is like gonna go into trance why did he run away whoa when you go into trance you do all sorts of strange things um, it's going into another state of consciousness where you can connect more directly with the spirit realm, with the God realm. And he brings words, information, knowledge, wisdom, guidance, information through from that other so world. They, got, uh, they don't have telephones. They, do, they have nothing. <laughs> they have oh, nothing yeah. which includes electricity. Do they have any type of machine or motor? Well, cars come in and out along the road, yes. So they have that type of engine. And um, do they have any other type of engine? But it used to be that they got in and out with mules, and you still get mules trekking What's over that? from Ley. What are mules? Mules are sort of a cross between a horse and a donkey. Uh, so yes. That's a bit okay. Strange. What? I don't know. I mean, I had got given this research grant um, and it was the most amazing opportunity, uh, wonderful experience. 
should that come my way again, then I'll do it. But I very much follow sort of what the universe puts in my lap and asks me to do, if you see what I mean. Yeah, so... How do they seem to feel about drugs and the hallucinogenics? Um, when it came to rituals and trance? Yeah, the trance seems to happen mainly through the drumming and the chanting that way. Because up there, I don't know what hallucinogenics are growing, if any. When you're right up in the high Himalayas, basically vegetables don't. You know, you get a few summer vegetable crops, so you get a lot of flowers. What, what there is growing there that would be hallucinogenic, I don't know. I didn't, didn't come across any, let's put it that way. There might be, but I didn't come across it. They didn't seem to be using it or practicing. No, I met with a few oracles and it was nearly always they went into trance during ceremony. Um, and having witnessed, you know, being part of that five-day ceremony, then I can understand that it was the drumming and the incense and the butter lamps, you know, that, that whole atmosphere that was created that, that took you into trance. And it is a very well-known method of going into trance, using drumming. More well known, but very well known, yes. Do psychic powers come through meditation, like, uh, you know, say you keep meditating for years and years? The lamas... Do you spontaneously arise, or, well, or do you have to, like, train in certain ways? The traditions say that as you practice your meditation and attain what's called samadhi, so psychic powers manifest. And that's the research I was doing, was looking at that tradition. And what I found with the monks and the lamas of Tibet and Bhutan is that for the first 10 or 15 years of practice, you don't really seem to get much difference in quality of psychic awareness from normal Western people that people have done research with over the last hundred years. But after about 15, 20 years of practice, then things start to change. And the lamas I worked with who'd done like 30, 35, 40 years of practice, they were way out there in terms of their awareness. Completely different clarity of awareness from, from most of the people I worked how with. Could you, how would you well, I was, I was actually doing experimental work with them and there was what in parapsychology is called, called um, testing that I was doing. So we were using a quite classic Western parapsychology method of testing, which we adapted to be appropriate for the Tibetans and we made it a bit like mirror divination. So they had a black laptop screen and they were asked to see a picture on the screen that they would then see at the very end of the session. And they then described what they'd seen, drew it out, described it to my interpreter, who then interpreted it for me. They then got to see four pictures, and they had to say which one was their picture. And they chose what they said was closest to their experience, and then they got to see what their picture actually was. So we could then do statistics and so on with it. Um, and the, the lamas who'd done 35, 40 years, they would be like 100%, boom, that's the one, boom, that's the one. Whereas most people, they'd get it right once every three or four times, you know, fairly much, just a bit above chance, but, but not that much. So it, it was quite remarkable to see that. I've talked about that research in greater depth elsewhere. Um, I think it's on my website even, that stuff. And uh, my feeling is, is that that tradition, that you practice your meditation and the clarity of awareness develops is, is, a, is a real tradition. Y yes, those high lamas doing the mode divination having done their years of practice, are going to be What's absolutely... Divination, seeing into the future. Yeah. Um, just very, very briefly, what were you studying and who, who gave you the grant and what was the objective? Well, the, I, what I was studying is what I've just said. Okay. 
the practice of meditation and its relationship with clairvoyance and precognition. And the grants were given from Trinity College, Cambridge, and from BL Foundation in Portugal. So I got two grants on the basis of that letter from the Dalai Lama secretary, which allowed me to go to Ladakh. <laughs> And it was for three or four months? No, well, no, it was um, three years research in all. I only spent three months in Ladakh out of that because I was also in South India. Well, um, I showed you, you know, the people with the Purbu blessing and the, the bronze disc, or the, yes. So that was all in South India. Uh, and I also spent time in Dharamsala. I met with some of the oracles and people in Dharamsala as well. Not all the oracles are men. You get women oracles as well as, as men oracles, get both. Well, I met 50-50. I met both female and male oracles. Did you search out for it to be 50-50? No, that's just what I met. Yes. Well, I'm now working at Sami Ling in Scotland, which is a Tibetan center. Um, and so far, the results are not showing the same as what I got with the Tibetans. And the people amongst the Tibetans who showed the strongest clairvoyance were those either from Bhutan or Ladakh who are actually living in the mountains. So I think the power of place is really important, really important. And to be up in the high mountains, I mean, apart from anything, during six months of the year, they couldn't leave the monasteries because of the snow and the cold. So you get forced into the stillness, and forced into the silence within, which of course allows the, the clarity of awareness. Um, and if you aren't living with telephones and radios and all the rest of it, then that also. I mean, there was one of the monks I worked with in Ley. He was running a meditation Dharma center in Ley. He came from one of the remote valleys. And he said to me that he wouldn't be able to exhibit the same level of psychic clairvoyance in Ley as he would do in his monastery up in the valley, because in Leh there was too much distraction. And I think that's quite telling. And where I showed you those wonderful temple masks in Saspol, I was going to work with an old Geshe there who was very highly honored and renowned. In the end, I wasn't able to because a disaster struck and all the bridges got washed away and it was just horrific. Um, but he said that in order to do the work properly for me, he would need to have five days preparation, where he would basically just go into meditation, you know, like 10 hours a day for five days to get himself into the right state of consciousness. So I do think that place is very, very important and that our lifestyle here, you know, with all of what we've got here, actually has taken us away from that state of consciousness. Yes, I do. What are you about just a minute, let other people ask questions. Anybody from there? This lady here, yeah. So what do you think about the importance of diet? What did you observe with regards to their diets and their abilities? Or oh! I mean, I do personally think that's an important thing. But in terms of thinking of the Ladakhis or of the Tibetans, of course, there the diet is related to the land. Um, and as I said, Tibetans don't do vegetables. You know, you do get a few vegetables growing in the summer um, and a bit of barley growing in the summer, but basically you're relying on the sheep and the yaks for your diet. So it's mainly cheese, milk, meat-based diet with a little bit of barley, which is made into what's called sampa. And then in the summer you get a few vegetables. Uh, but that's because that's what the land supports and so the people are living according to what there is in the land. Here in the West, I think that yes, we need to be quite careful with our diet because we're living in this superabundance, this overabundance and so it's very easy for us 
to eat inappropriately. And the other thing with that that I would say is that I spent um, three years living in the ashram in Bihar and there they have what they call a sattvic diet which they consider really important um, in terms of meditation and getting the consciousness and that's a very simple plain diet no, no, it's completely vegan um, no sugar or very little sugar um, and mainly rice and dal and, and vegetables that's a Hindu diet, yeah. Um, the, it's the, the Saraswati lineage. So it's a yoga one. I'd call it yoga rather than Hindu. Well, the Tibetans, of course, are using sound all the time. And they use sound as part of the magical ritual. Um, and so, for instance, the thigh bone trumpet. Um, and then these very long trumpets making the very deep sound. And they have huge drums. Um, one of the temples I went into, Sherab Ling, the drum must have been from there at its bottom up to there, that round. So can you imagine beating that and the sound? It vibrates here. And I swear to you, I was sitting on the steps of the temple um, and they were beating the drum, you know, this good rhythmic beat and it says boom, this deep, deep, deep boom. And I was sitting, because I was waiting for an office to open so I could make an appointment with the big high lama, um, just sitting on the steps and there's a courtyard, buildings are all four sides, yes, a courtyard, clear blue sky, it's India, isn't it, clear blue sky. And I swear to you, a single cloud came over the courtyard in the shape of a snow lion. Now, I wasn't tripping. I hadn't been smoking anything that particular day. I, I was in a straight state of consciousness. And when I got back to Dharamsala a few days later, because I was a few days out from Dharamsala, and I was talking about my experience, and there happened to be somebody else who'd been in Sherabling that day, and she'd seen it too. <laughs> so I know that that drum conjured a cloud snow line out of the blue sky. That drum did it? Yeah, it's an amazing drum. God. Incredible beat. So yes, yeah, so the magic of sound. They, they really do use sound in a big way. And the chanting, the, the rhythm of the chanting as well when they chant the pujas. Their meditation Okay, so the monks training will involve doing lots of the pujas, of the ceremonies, the rituals. Um, they, they will learn to do this very deep chanting. I don't know if you've heard the, the monks, but they go into a very, very, very deep, deep, deep voice and they chant from that very deep voice. So imagine a man going, dropping right, right, right down. So they learn to do that very deep chanting with that very deep voice. Um, they will use symbols, they will blow conches, um, and they learn the different instruments and the drum as well. So that's part of a monk's training, is, is all of that, as well as the different meditation techniques and so on. Yeah. And they also have to learn the equivalent of an A4 sheet, so it's 500 words, Every day for five years, they have to memorize all of that. Can you imagine worth of an A4 sheet every day, that, that equivalent? And you hear them from like five o'clock in the morning right through till about midnight. And of course, they've got different things going on during the day. But they're chanting out in order to get them memorized. So they learn, they memorize by chanting. 
chanting, chanting, chanting. So you hear them the whole time, chanting, chanting, to, to memorise this stuff. So they really work with memorisation, and that's training the mind. So what they memorise during the day, they then have to debate it in the evening. So you get these debating sessions where it's a question and answer thing in order to make sure that they've really understood what they've memorised. So it's good, very intense training. So they come in, you know, between the ages of four and eight. They do their secondary school stuff where they learn the reading, writing, all of that. And then from about 18, they do another 18 years of what's called Geshe degree, which is like PhD in philosophy. Then after that, they go to tantric school, and that's where they start to do the meditation practices and, and all of the tantric practices. So it's, a, it's an intense training. Yeah, we have nothing like it in the West. They're not doing their magical rituals from a place of ignorance. They're really intensely trained to do their rituals. Yes. Even the Rinpoches, so those who are considered to be Tulkus, who are considered to be High Lamas from before, they have to do the training. And this is the tragedy of the Panchen Lama being abducted by the Chinese, because although the Dalai Lama recognized that little boy as the reincarnation of the Panchen Lama, without the training, he's nothing. So even the really high Rinpoches have to have the training. Yeah, they, they do it. I worked with quite a few young Rinpoches, and they were being rigorously trained. If, if anything, they get a tougher, stricter training than the ordinary monks. I'll go to this lady next. Yeah. I'm really curious to know whether you ever get um, children that are chosen as Rinpoches that then grow up and use them against Yes, you do. Please. Particularly now that they're in the West. Um, they. I was told when I was at Sarah J Monastery that they reckon that those monks who come to the West, 80% of them will disrobe, and that includes Rinpoches. The, uh, well, I joked with the, the, the Rinpoche who was looking after me, saying that the Tibetan protector deities were no match for the Western demons. It is. It is a pity in some ways. And yet in another ways, maybe there's something new coming out of it. Because, for instance, at Sami Ling, they're taking some of the meditation technique trainings, separating them out of what I call the religious context, and teaching them as MSc courses at Aberdeen University. So you can do mindfulness and compassion as a secular thing for an MSc at a Scottish university. And I, I see that somehow as a transition, as a change through to the 21st century, to the Aquarian spirituality, where it's a spiritual training of mindfulness and compassion, which is of great benefit. And it's left behind a lot of the dogma that maybe was best to be left behind. I think that maybe a lot of babies are being thrown out with the bathwater and that a lot could come in that, that we, in the West, we do ourselves a disservice by taking things out of context and just, but at the other level, it means that now there's lots of professional people who are working in social services and so on and so forth, who've got mindfulness and compassion as, as part of their, the strings in their bow. So... I've got ifs and ands about it, but I do see that there is a, a, a shift happening. Yes? What's that use of dance? In well, I showed the cham dancers, didn't I? Well, did you miss that? Yeah, that? That was towards the beginning. I showed the, the New Year ceremonies. Um, and it's not only at New Year, but it's primarily at New Year. And they dress up as the deities both the, the, the beneficent deities 
and the, the protected deities, the, 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 the animal heads and all of that. Um, and they do this ritualized ceremonial dancing as part of the ceremony for going into the new year. I yes. Was Yeah. If you go up in, in August to their tea party, they usually have a ceremony with, with some dancers as well as you can, you can sort of see quite a lot of the things. It's a, sort of quite a modern context in, in, in yes. classic of theirs. Yes. But I, I think it's quite nice. Yes. Yes, it, you, you do get the Tibetans coming over here to do the tram dance, um, as obviously as a tourist thing rather than as a, <coughs> a purely magical ceremonial thing. Yeah. Okay, guys, well, I'm happy to stop there because my voice, I can feel it, is finding more and more of a strain. So thank you very much. I'm sorry I kept it short. But... What happened about bridges? The bridge got washed away. Oh, lots of bridges got washed away because they have these dreadful climate change things going on which is really destroying the land and the people. What happened? Um, oh, they've just had disastrous floods happening. Disastrous.